Welcome back everybody to our lecture introduction to quantum optics. Today we want to discuss the two-level atom interacting with a coherent state in a single mode of the radiation field. And we're going to look at some experiments in the end which I find some of the most beautiful experiments, some of my favorites in quantum optics. So let's get started. So here's our light field and here's the atom and the light field we suppose to be in a coherent state. And remember that at any point in time we can write down the combined state of the atom and the light field as a sum over C2n of t, the atom being the excited state with n photons in the system, plus C1n of t, the atom being in the ground state with n photons in the system, 1, n with n running from 0 to infinity. So let's consider an initial condition where we start out with a coherent state, the atom being in the uh, excited state, so the ground state population is zero, so C1, n at time t equals zero is zero, and C2 of n at time equals zero, the probability distribution for that, that's just going to be the Poissonian probability distribution of our coherent state, remember with n bar being norm alpha squared. Okay. So this is how we can choose our initial state amplitudes and now we want to look at the time evolution. So what do we know about this time evolution? Well we know from the last class that if we have different Fox states, each of those Fox states will give rise to Rabi oscillations between the excited state and the ground state at the quantized Rabi frequency g times square root n plus 1. And this is what we've seen here. These were the solutions we just derived in the last class. And uh, now I can write down the solution also for the state vector, state amplitude c1, n as a function of time. This is of course here the second line is only valid for all n larger or equal to 1. We don't want this to become negative. And now let's have a look for example how the inversion evolves as a function of time. Remember the inversion was the excited state probability minus the ground state probability of our atom. So now we can just calculate the excited state probability. This is just this term here. We sum over all the populations where the atom is in the excited state. We have n photons and we sum from n running to 0 to infinity. This gives us p2 of t. And this last term here, this just gives us p1 of t. Uh, now if you do that calculation, if you put the Rabi oscillations in here, it's very simple to show that what you're going to get in the end is a sum over norm C2n at time t equals 0 squared times cosine of 2g square root n plus 1t with n running from 0 to infinity. So the inversion basically is just a sum of different Rabi oscillations occurring at different Rabi frequencies here, 2g square root n plus 1. And we're not surprised by that because we have the coherent state being formed by a superposition state of different Fox states. Each of those Fox states make Rabi oscillations at their own quantized Rabi frequency, so we expect in the end the inversion also to be kind of a sum of these different Rabi frequencies in the system. And that's what we indeed see, what we get by just using these formulas, plugging them in here, we can just derive this um, a formula for the time evolution of the inversion. So now let's plot this and I've written down the formula again here. So remember the initial probability distribution we expected the atom to be in the excited state but the probability to have n photons then that was just given by the Poissonian probability distribution. And here I've plotted the inversion as a function of time in units of the inverse coupling constant g uh, for a mean photon number of 20 and you can see that what we get actually is something quite different than the semi-classical Rabi oscillations. Remember, if we were starting in the semi-classics with the atom in the excited state and had a classical light field interacting with the atom, we just expected cosinusoidal Rabi oscillations to persist forever without damping being present in the system. Now we see we find quite a different phenomena. We find the Rabi oscillations to start out and then they seem to collapse in a time scale Tc, and then they seem to revive at a later time Tr, then they collapse again and revive again, and all this phenomena that is now quite new in this treatment we call the collapse and revival of the Rabi oscillations. 
And they're really a genuinely new feature that we only can have in this quantized light field description. Uh, they would not occur in any semi-classical treatment. So now let's try to estimate the collapse time and the revival time. And let's also then try to understand why in the classical limit, when we take the classical limit, those collapse and revivals actually vanish. So why does the collapse happen? So the collapse we can basically think of as happening exactly at the point where the different Rabi oscillations run pi out of phase. So what you see you had these different cosinusoidal oscillations. When the phases start to run out of uh, by phase by pi, then we don't expect these Rabi oscillations to add up, but rather they're going to destructively interfere and we can see why the whole dynamics can vanish in such a situation. So for our coherent state, I can approximate it for large n, for large n bar, for large average photon numbers, I can uh, approximate the Poissonian distribution function by a Gaussian distribution function with the average photon number n bar and the standard deviation given by delta n. And what was the standard deviation for our coherent state? Do you remember? Well, that was just square root n bar, right? So here I've written down what I said before. The condition for the collapse to estimate the collapse time is that when the phases of the Rabi oscillations of the underlying distribution function run out of phase by pi. So we can say, okay, we have a certain width of this distribution function given by n bar plus delta n, n bar minus delta n here. And if those Rabi oscillations start to run out of phase by pi, then we can start to have the collapse phenomena. So let's estimate what we get now for this. So we have the Rabi frequency n bar delta n, that would be just 2g of square root n bar plus the standard deviation, and the standard deviation is just square root n bar minus 2g square root n bar minus square root n bar times Tc, that should be on the order of pi to have the collapse time. Now we can make a Taylor expansion. We can just say that this is square root n bar times square root of 1 plus 1 divided by square root n bar. And this is our small parameter x. And if we Taylor expand square root of 1 plus x, we get approximately 1 plus 1 half x. So this is approximately 1 plus 1 half 1 over square root n bar. And the same thing we get, of course, here and this being approximately square root n bar times 1 minus 1 half 1 over square root n bar. Now we pull everything together and we actually see that this will just give us 2g times Tc on the order of pi. So the collapse time, T collapse, is just pi, approximately pi, over Tg in our system. Okay, So let's write this down again here. So this is the collapse time, the time scale for the Rabi oscillations to decay here, Tc. And uh, this 2g, that's just a vacuum Rabi oscillation frequency. So that's equivalent to pi over the vacuum Rabi frequency omega zero in our system. So you see the only thing that determines this time scale for the collapse to happen is the coupling strength of the atom to the light field. The larger this coupling strength is, the faster this decay is going to happen, and the lower the coupling strength is, the longer this time scale is going to be. So now let's estimate the revival time. So the revival of the Rabi oscillations is going to take place when all the neighboring Rabi oscillations come in phase again and add up constructively. So that would happen when omega n bar plus 1 minus omega n bar times the revival time, that's the different phase factors for neighboring Rabi frequencies, when that becomes on the order of 2 pi. So they can add up constructively again. So now let's do the same calculation as before. That would mean that 2g times square root n bar plus 1 minus 2g square root n bar times the revival time is on the order of 2 pi. Now we can make again the Taylor expansion, 2g square root n bar times um, square root of 1 plus 1 over n bar minus 2g square root n bar 
t revival is on the order of 2 pi. So now we make the Taylor expansion again here. This just gives us approximately 1 plus 1 half, 1 over n bar. So we see that in this case, we the first term subtracts, cancels out with this term. The only term that remains is the term 2g square root n bar divided by 1 over 2 n bar times our revival time. That should be on the order of 2 pi. So these two cancels and we see that we cancel here this square root factor. So we see that the revival time is essentially 2 pi times square root n bar divided by g. Or if I want to introduce my vacuum Rabi frequency, 2g here and a 2 here, that would basically be 4 pi times square root of n bar divided by the vacuum Rabi frequency in my system. So you see that actually the revival time depends explicitly on the average occupation number. The collapse time did not. So the collapse time was basically pi over um, omega zero, whereas the revival time here, the time scale to come back to see these revives, revivals of the Rabi oscillations, that depended on the square root of the mean photon number in the system and the Rabi frequency, the vacuum Rabi frequency. All right, so now let's take a look how we can derive the classical limit from these equations. How can we recover the classical Rabi oscillations that we had been discussing before in the semi-classical treatment? How do they arise from this quantized treatment? Well, basically, we see that in order to have a pronounced collapse of the Rabi oscillations, to have a very short time scale for the collapse, we need a large coupling constant. Large coupling constant means that the quantized volume of the box we were using to derive the modes of the radiation field had to be very small. So now the classical limit would of course be the opposite, where we take the box size to infinity such that quantization doesn't matter so much anymore. We basically recover the continuum limit of the system. So the quantized limit will happen when we take the box volume to infinity. That will mean g goes to zero, the coupling constant between the atom and the light field. But now we want to do this in a way such that the Rabi frequency stays constant. So we want to take the limit, the classic limit, in the following way. We want to take the volume of the box to infinity such that the coupling constant goes to zero. And at the same time, the average photon number has to go to infinity such that 2g times square root n bar, which is just our Rabi frequency, our classical Rabi frequency, stays constant. Okay. So we take the limit g going to zero, n bar going to infinity in such a way that 2g times square root of n bar equals a constant, stays constant. Now if that's the case, then you see that the collapse time, which was this pi over 2g, this collapse time basically goes to infinity for g going to zero. And that's, of course, exactly what we encounter in the classical limit. That exactly gives us the absence of collapse and revival phenomena in the classical limit. So you see, actually, by taking this limit, going with the box to infinity with the coupling constant to zero, but at the same time increasing square root n bar in such a way that the Rabi frequency stays constant, we see that the collapse becomes absent. So this whole phenomena of collapse and revival of Rabi oscillations really depends on having a finite coupling constant in the system. And uh, therefore, a small box, small as possible box volume that we can have to have g as large as possible. And we'll discuss in the next class experimental setups in so-called cavity quantum electrodynamics that make use of this by making very tiny volumes in space where this volume is so small that the coupling constant between the light and the atom is very large.